Hello and welcome to another episode of Literary Gladiators, the show where we discuss and debate literature in all of its forms. If it's written work, it's game. As you could see, uh, not everybody was able to show up, but the show... I ate their livers with a side of fava beans and a nice Chianti. <laughs> Did Charlie taste like cookies? <laughs> nah. Uh, anyhow, uh, I'm Josh Caparelli from Caponomics. Jim. And today we're going to be going over Sylvia Plath's very overdramatic confessional work, Daddy. We should begin with the first discussion point. Why do you believe Plath took the path of comparing her daddy to a member of the Nazi party? Well, it's uh, the extreme oppressor, you know. She identifies with a major silence group in that whole line. I begin to talk like a Jew. I think I may well be a Jew. And then, what did the Nazis hate more than Jews? She's like, I can be everything this man who's supposed to be my father and is supposed to love me unconditionally hated. She was, uh, her dad was German born. He came off as being very uh, domineering and she was not, she was Unitarian, but the obvious comparisons between uh, the uh, Nazis and Jews uh, would make for the public. Right, it's non-literal. She is just comparing herself to a member of an oppressed group. She does this again in Lady Lazarus. Yeah, I remember reading that. That was very over the top, just as I feel Sylvia Plath is very much over the top. Of her. What she's doing in Lady Lazarus is she's comparing uh, the doctors who revive her after she tries to commit suicide to Dr. Mangala, the Nazi doctor uh, who committed the human experiments. That's pretty much, uh, she touches up on that in Daddy. With uh, mm -hmm. She mentions that when she was 20, she tried to go back to him, but... They revived her and nothing happened. She, she survived, which, much to her dismay, but at the same time, you can't really expect so much with her. With right. It's very, she, she's a very complicated. That's why the, uh, when you're studying confessional poetry, she's one of the people. As much as you, you're either going to love her or hate her, you have love to go her. over her. Love her. Yeah, maybe you. But pretty much, uh, did you feel that her vision is accurate, or is she just trying to gain her sympathy? I don't think it's either. I think it's like, well, it would be a ploy for sympathy, I suppose, if it is non-literal. Pretty much. I would think, when I first uh, approached this work, I thought almost, it was almost certain that she was doing this was very over exaggerated and that she's not in the right state of mind to uh, be trusted and that it was uh, she was only doing this for major self pity but after reading up on the situation I did learn that her dad was a Nazi uh, sympathizer and he he did. Uh, he was a teacher at a college, uh, but when he first came to America, he was denied several jobs because of his views. Primarily during the First World War, and during the rise of the party, and that he didn't, he would not say anything with regard to the American uh, when it came to siding with the Americans. But then later on, he misdiagnosed his. Uh, diabetes in his foot, which she mentions uh, her, uh, his big black toe. And yeah. She goes on with that. But at that point in time, things begin to open up and we begin to uh, wonder, maybe she does have a point right. in some particular way. But with most of her other, you have to really take her with a grain of salt. She is, a, if you're into confessional poetry, you, you are getting a bit of brutal honesty, but you need to do your background. You have Anne Sexton, you have Robert Lowell, you have uh, John Berryman. Elizabeth Bishop is debatable in that category. 
Well, as a footnote to the whole thing about the black toe, which is a sign of gangrene, which was eventually an extension of diabetic infection, mm -hmm. there are drawings of, uh, when you see drawings of Satan, he has cleft feet and blackened toes. Wow. Yeah, that pretty, that mm -hmm. connects to the descriptions that she gave about how comparing him to Satan and comparing him to a vampire. That primarily the Nazi descriptions right. that very much uh, are parallel to Hitler mm -hmm. and the whole her portraying herself as a Jew because it's in a uh, oh look at me pity me pity me yeah she's and like what? I have it so hard at home I may as well be a Jew in the camps mm. which isn't kind of, fair. Not really. Granted, uh, some wise people have said that there hasn't been good poetry since the Holocaust because nobody right. can capture such tragic emotion because that was inflicted on and there was no just to it. It was just a ploy to garner power. Sylvia Plath comes around in the early 1960s the war has been 15 years completed, and, right. and here she is playing on that same note like it's never ended. Yeah, and that that's very, people can really, uh, they may really despise that. Uh, I, when I ran a literature club at my college, uh, the advisor, he highly advised people, don't read her work at all. But, on the uh, contrary, how much importance do you believe she was to the genre of confessional poetry? Oh, she's a major figure, you know, Fever 103, um, The Beekeeper, all of it. It's all such good. Lady Lazarus. I have to go over, I have to re uh, reread Lady Lazarus. I read that for an American literature class, but I would have to dig deeper. I. I've held out from buying a collection of hers. I would probably just look it up online because I'm not, I'm really not all that fascinated with her and what uh, she stood for. One of the things that really uh, disgusted me was the way that she chose to take her life by, by sticking her head in an oven while her children were in the house. Mm -hmm. Granted, I have learned that she uh, had them uh, locked in their bedroom and she had a wet towel so that they would not get affected by the carbon monoxide poisoning, which in some ways was a bit thoughtful. But to put them through that is, when they, become to re when they begin to realize, it would be very hurtful. Yeah, she made sure the kids wouldn't watch, she made sure the kids wouldn't be affected, but still they were there. Of course they would be. If, right. if anybody was to lose a parrot to a thoughtless act, some very, to a, for, to taking their own life, that would, that's going to affect them either way. It's going to affect everyone that in some particular fashion had an affection for them or a, a connection, whether they were relatives or friends. And she pretty much, uh, she didn't think of it that way. She just thought about, I'm through, I need to go, I need, it's over, kind of thing. Right. Granted, with regard to confessional poetry, she's, you almost have to go over her because it, it's people like her that define uh, taking that into full effect. I'm more of an Anne Sexton fan, but I, uh, you're going to have to go over it at some point in time, even though mm -hmm. you're going to, you can either be like Jim, who loves her, or me, who, and I'm not fond of them, so it's a split between the two. Do you have any final thoughts to contribute? I do. These didn't relate to any questions, but I had made several points, like some key lines I had wanted to bring up. Yeah. Any? Read I, all. all right. First off, 
she describes the uh, her father in one of the first stanzas as like the ghastly statue with one gray toe big as a Frisco seal. Right? No, 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 that's the point that we made about his uh, diabetes that became getting green and he right. was diagnosed it that led to the end of his life, thus he did not have a presence. Uh, she said he would she said she was ten, but she was only eight at the time. Just, uh, but looking a little further at the image of a statue, what is it but uh, uh, something that is supposed to represent a body, but it's made out of unfeeling stone. Mm. You know, she, she can't connect to that. And that's what she saw her father as, especially his uh, minimal presence, too. And then double it off, the image of gray, you know, that's the color of ashes. He's already mm. dead, even in this Ready new form that's much. supposed to preserve him forever as this work of art. He's dead. Gray, in a negative way, also right. represents coldness, even though... On a positive note, it also represents modesty. What was the other point that you had? Um, and she's talking about uh, the snows of the Tyrol, the, the clear beer of Vienna are not very pure or true with my Tyrock pack and my Tyrock pack and my weird luck and everything. Hmm. Um, she's like mocking the idea of, you know, the pure blood, the true Aryan, all this stuff Hitler put forth because it's like. The Vienna and the Tyrol and everything are the places in Austria. Mm. And Hitler was Austrian. He was not German. And he talks about, like, the grace of the German people, you know, and we have to eliminate all threats to the Aryan the whole, race. The blonde hair and blue eyes when mm -hmm. he actually had dark hair. I think his eyes were lighter. I thought they used to be brown, but then I did some further research. What was the third line you had? All right, uh, the whole not God but a swastika so black no sky could squeak through. It's uh, She's playing on the perversion of symbols, you know. The swastika began as a religious icon in India, and then the Nazis reappropriated it. I made a point about that as well. Uh, mentioned that, uh, it also mentions that uh, he's uh, a Nazi worshipper in a way. Yes. By not saying nothing means... is is really uh, a negative thing, right? But it, uh, he was able to uh, take the opportunity to uh, win her mother over. The fact that everybody loves a fascist. Yes, that that's a famous line. A lot of feminist critics have taken a lot of exception to that line. Much ink has been spilled about that. <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, very debatable line. I don't know if that's the same way they look at things these days. Maybe back uh, in that place in that era. But you had something else? Yes, the whole, um, then I knew what to do, made a model of you, a man in black with a Mein Kampf look, a love of the rack and the screw, and on and on and on. Ooh. Here's her solution. She's like, I've had this oppressive man in my life. You know what my solution to that is? I'm gonna marry someone just like him. Then somehow, through some unstated way, this is an interpretive gap in the story, in the text. I'm going to destroy him, and thus by proxy destroy my father. See the whole: if I've killed one man, I've killed two. Are the vampire who said he was you and drained my blood. Are you for referring you. to Ted Hughes, or maybe? Mm, Granted, guy, uh, he really. We didn't hear much about him, uh, unless uh, I know that they they had somebody that came over to watch the kids. I don't know if that was on him or was on the doctor. I'm going to make a passing reference to a friend of mine because I have to do this, Dr. Archer. I'm going to tell a story about them. You told me when we read this, and you were telling me about your daughter, and she visited Plath's grave and cut out the Hughes part. Uh. <laughs> Who, uh, pl uh, whoever Platt told, or no, uh, no, Jocelyn did it. Oh, I wonder <laughs> if that's going to make any news. <laughs> if it was Elvis Presley's grave, it'd be one thing. <laughs> but and you had one more on there. Oh uh, yes, yes. Um, 
the whole the idea of the black telephones off at the root right before she says she's done. So what's a telephone doing? It's already implying that there's distance between the people that are trying to communicate across some distance. But if it's cut off at the root, then there's no connection. Uh, da, da, da. Oh wow, that's not an <laughs> innuendo to say the very least. Um, yeah. I pretty much uh, the last uh, stanza saying that she's through, and I see that as a bit contradictory. She affirms that she's through, but it doesn't sound like it, the way that she's going. There. Yeah, she doesn't sound done with him. No, and it, from what we've seen throughout her life, it really, it becomes a continuum. She really is not in any uh, route to improving herself. And then the whole, uh, by destroying this man she married, she won over, like she triumphed somehow. It doesn't sound like she won, but you get that again in Lady Lazarus, you know, air god, air Lucifer, beware, beware, out of the ash I rise with my red hair, and I eat men like air. Oh, mm -hmm. One thing I believe that is uh, that we know for sure is that her psychiatrist much he must be a very rich person. <laughs> he must have made a boatload of money with the appointments he's uh, had to put up with her. But in Lazarus, you get the allusion to the phoenix right in that last stanza I've just cited. So it's like there is an idea of continuous triumph despite a recycle into adversity. Ooh. Because phoenixes rise from ashes. Pretty much. Uh, if only she was able to do the same thing herself. Oh, because she burned up. That that was low. <laughs> <laughs> Granted, if you want to read her work, you could probably look it up online. I don't know if I should suggest that you... Uh, do it. Buy the collection. Buy the collection. It is worth it. If you want your hair to turn gray or fall out, then <laughs> maybe go ahead and buy, listen to him. But if you want to spare yourself, I'm going to leave a poem, the, the poem at the bottom. And it'll cost no money, and if you don't like it, you can X out of it. Join us back next time for another episode of Literary Gladiators. For now, keep reading.